Well, thanks for being here on this Easter morning to celebrate with us uh, the resurrection of Christ. So uh, a mom named Jennifer Stefano got a call one day, and it was a call that a parent would never want to get. It was her daughter, Brianna, who was 15 years old, and she said, Mom, they have me. They took me. And then she said, I messed up. And then this guy gets on the phone and he says to the mom, if you don't bring us this amount of money at this place by this time, we are going to kill your daughter. Can you imagine what was going through the mom's mind as she heard those words? Turns out it was fake. Wasn't even real. Somebody had taken Brianna's voice from an online video that she had posted and they had created a voice that sounded just like hers to try to scam her parents out of money. About a year ago, I ordered some uh, brand name shoes that I like. My kids call them dad shoes, so I won't tell you what brand so you can make fun of me. But I ordered, I ordered these dad shoes, Echo, that's the brand. And I got them and I put them on and they didn't feel like the other shoes, that brand that I had. And I started to look at them compared to the old ones that were worn out and they ended up being fake. So I got scammed, I returned it, got my money back. But I didn't know that it looked like it in the picture when I got the shoes, they were fake. I was in another country one time and this guy comes up beside of me and he said, uh, hey, uh, hey buddy, uh, I have a Rolex watch. You wanna buy a Rolex watch? And I was like, well, not really, 50 bucks. I was like, well, that's a deal. I admit it. I said, no, I'm not interested. So I kept walking away. He said, $25. And the further I walked, the lower the price of that authentic, fake Rolex watch got. You know, with the rapid expansion of AI, it's getting harder and harder to tell truth or reality from a lie. It's getting, we live at a time that no other generation on the face of the earth, so all of us living on the earth today are dealing with something that no other group of people has ever had to deal with. We see something, we read it, we see a picture, we see somebody say something, maybe it's real, maybe it's not. And then with the whole uh, election season going on, it feels like it's been going on for 10 years, How do we know what we see is true? It could be fake and you're scrolling through and you would never know it because you know you see those car crash videos that half of them are fake anyway, but you don't know that. We live at a unique time where it's essential that we learn and know what is real. We're gonna do a little game today. We're gonna play a little Easter game. All right, so I'm gonna put a picture on the screen and we're gonna, by show of hands, and I need everybody to participate, I'm gonna ask you which one you think is real, which one you think is fake, and, and then you're gonna vote based on uh, what you see. All right, put the first picture up. Who thinks the picture on the left is real? All right. Who thinks the picture on the right is real? The real picture is the one on the left. Here's what's interesting. If you, you can't change your vote. I mean, after I say it, I see people, okay, I'll take, I'll take that one. If you knew that cove at Lake Tahoe, that's where that picture was taken. If you knew that cove, you would immediately known the other one was fake. Now to go to the next picture. It's gonna get harder as it goes along. Who thinks the couple on the left is the real couple? Who thinks the couple on the right is the real couple? It's the couple on the right that's the real couple. Couple on the left is fake. If you knew the couple on the right and you knew both of them or one of them was fake, you would immediately know, well, I know them. Of course, that other one's fake because I know the people on the right. If you knew what was real, it'd be easier to pick out what was fake. Put the next one up there. Oh, I'm getting hungry at this point in the day. (laughs) So avocado toast, one's fake, one's real. Who thinks the one on the left is real? Who thinks the one on the right is real? The one on the right is the real one. Yeah. And they both are, they both make us want to go eat, right? All right. The last one might be the hardest one. All right. Set of headphones. 
I'm going to, I'll switch it up. Who thinks the one on the left is fake? Who thinks the one on the right is fake? They're both fake. (laughs) Neither of them are real. There has never been a more important time for us to be able to discern that which is real from that which is fake. And here's, here's a principle that if you apply this, it will help you. Knowing what's real exposes what's not. There's so much fake in the world, we can't possibly go out and learn all the fake, but we can learn what's real. And we can know what's real. What you heard read on the video before I came out was a section from the book of 1 John. 1 John is a book that was written by the Apostle John. He also wrote 2 and 3 John. He wrote Revelation. He also wrote the Gospel of John. So he's done quite a bit of writing, and he writes 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John to the 1st century church to help people know what's real. He wrote the book for several reasons. One was to just help the church discern. By that point in the 1st century, near the later part, there was a lot of false teaching. There was a lot of misunderstandings going on. People were struggling with their faith. The church was already in crisis that early because of all the falsehoods that were being taught. Believers were being deceived, and some of them had lost their confidence in their salvation. And so a lot of what John talks about is you can have confidence that when you believe in Jesus, you are saved. And that's not something you do, save, lost, save, lost. When you're saved, you're saved. And he's trying to help them understand that because that's what's real. They were doctrinally confused and they were morally confused. They didn't know uh, if the doctrine being taught to them, the theology being taught to them, whether, whether it was right or wrong, they were getting confused. And so that led over to morally, they didn't know what to do and they didn't know how to act. And so he writes to bring clarity. And what he does, he takes them back to the basics and talks about what was real. In our world today, There's a lot of confusion. In churches today, there's a lot of confusion. So we're starting this. It's a new series we're starting today. This is not like just a a standalone where I'm going to talk to you about something at Easter and then, hey, come back next week. Uh, We're going to start uh, a new series. We're starting today going through the book of 1 John to learn what's real. So if this is your one or two times a year, come back next week (laughs) because I'm going to keep talking about what First John has to say. So here's how he begins. That which was from the beginning, so he's going all the way back to what's real, which we have heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we've seen it and testify to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. He's talking about the resurrected Christ appearing to the disciples. The us that he's talking about, the we that he's talking about, are the disciples who all got to witness Jesus risen from the dead. Because people were already starting to say that never happened. And so he said, we've seen it. We've heard him. We saw him who came from the Father. We saw it. The people in that group would be Mary, one of Jesus' disciples, who saw the risen Lord and went to all the other disciples and she proclaims, I have seen the Lord. In that group would be Thomas, who doubted if Jesus rose from the dead and Jesus shows up and said, well, feel this. I'm really here. I've risen from the dead. And he says, he proclaims, my Lord and my God. And then the apostle Peter When he saw the resurrected Lord, he just yells out, it's the Lord. And he runs towards him. And so the we that John is talking about are the people who that had seen Jesus in the flesh risen from the dead. Now the biggest heresy going on in the first century that was causing confusion was that people were teaching that Jesus did not come in the flesh that he just appeared, that it looked like he was in the flesh, but they just kind of saw that, and he was really more like a a hologram, like a spirit. Like he wasn't real. He wasn't a real 
being in the flesh. That teaching was called Gnosticism. And Gnosticism taught a lot of different things. It taught that Jesus didn't come in the flesh because all flesh is evil, so he wouldn't do that. Uh, They taught that uh, you can have this secret knowledge that nobody else could have, that God would reveal to you about you and whatever you wanted to do. And they taught weird things like that. And so John is refuting that when he starts to say, hey, look, I wanna tell you. And then he engages our senses, the way we perceive reality. He starts to engage our senses and he starts with, hey, I wanna proclaim what I've heard. I heard this with my ears. I heard Jesus' sermons. I heard him say how to love people. I heard him say how to forgive people. I heard him say how we deny ourselves. I heard him say, go teach other people about me. I heard all of that. And then John says, what we've also looked at. We saw the miracles. We saw sinners being forgiven. We saw hard hearts softened. We saw people's lives change. We saw it. We saw the miracles. We saw people healed. We saw people delivered. And if you've been around our church for very long at all, we share stories all the time of people's lives that have changed. Marriages that were on the rocks, thought they were gonna end, and then all of a sudden they came together around Jesus and they did the hard work and got it going healthy again. People who were struggling with addictions, People who were struggling with feeling left out. People who had broken relationship after broken relationship. And we have witnessed people's lives change because they had an experience with God at our church, somehow connected relationally. So we've seen that. That's what John is saying. I've looked at what Jesus has done. And then he says, what our hands have touched So if you're trying to refute a belief that says Jesus didn't come in the flesh, of course you're gonna say what our hands have touched because you you can't hug a spirit. It doesn't work. You can't shake a spirit's hand. And so he's saying, you need to know that our hands have touched Jesus. And if you read everything that John wrote from the gospel of John, first, second, and third John in particular, there's a lot of talk about uh, physical touch that people, a woman touched Jesus. She touched the hem of his garment. Jesus sat little children on his lap. Somebody hugged Jesus. And he's letting people know this was not just a spirit and in our imagination, he's a real person that came in the flesh from heaven. He said, we've seen it, we testify, and now we proclaim this to you. I've seen Jesus is what John's saying. I've experienced Jesus. And now he's saying, I want you to have the same experience I've had. I want you to see and experience Jesus. I want Jesus to be so real to you that you can't not talk about it because that's what John is saying. We're proclaiming this. If you proclaim something, that's just not like a casual conversation. It's a proclamation that I've seen Jesus, I've heard Jesus, and now I'm proclaiming to you that he's true. And that's what he expects of us. We've all had things in our life that we're excited about. It, what, what are you excited about? We're excited. When a baby's born, oh, we get excited. You gotta let everybody know. You used to have to send out baby announcements. They were cards. And you sent them out. Now you just post it on Instagram and the world knows. When you got married, uh, you used to have to call people and tell them. Now you just post it and everybody knows. Picture the ring uh, and somehow he's, you know, you had somebody there with a camera. I didn't even think about when I asked my wife to marry me. I got to get somebody with a camera to hide behind that tree over there because (laughs) it's just got to be on Instagram. But now it's a different day and it's great that we get to see all those special moments. And those special moments, we proclaim them to the world. And what John is saying is, your experience with Christ should be something that you're willing to proclaim to the world around you. When you experience Jesus, you share Jesus. We're all influencers. No matter how many followers we have on social media, you're a follower of Jesus, you're an influencer. You can influence the people around you. He's given you the power to influence other people. 
And you do that by proclaiming what God has done for you and what you've experienced with him to others. Have you ever heard the quote, preach the gospel always and when necessary, use words? That quote is attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. The only problem is he never said that. There's no record of him ever saying that. Somebody attributed that to him. And what that quote has done, it sounds nice, but what it says is, don't ever tell anybody about Jesus. Just be kind and nice and that's enough. That's not enough. What we need to be motivated to do as followers of Christ is to proclaim the resurrected Lord to a world that desperately needs to hear it. That's what John is encouraging the church to do. You're confused doctrinally, morally, proclaim your faith to other people. Proclaim what Jesus has done in your life. And at a time of confusion, if you get to a point of confusion in your life, what you need to do is go back to what's real. I was joking with somebody a couple of weeks ago about uh, my inability to do math. So when I first got to college, you know, I took, I took a few, uh, you know, you got to take a few tests because I didn't score high enough on the ACT. And, uh, you know, I, I was able to get out of a couple classes that were about reading and writing. I could easily get out of those if I had to write something or say something. But when it came to math, I remember my advisor saying, um, you need to take like a remedial math class. Like we need to take you back to the basics of math. So the first year of math started with a zero, not a one before I could get level. So I had to go back to the basics. And when it comes to confusion about faith in life, we need to go back to the basics. Anytime a couple comes to me, and I've done this dozens of times through the years. Hey, pastor, can we talk to you? Things are a little rough in our marriage right now. And I always say, well, I'm not a marriage counselor, but I will gladly meet with you and give you spiritual advice about what God has to say about marriage and about how you can start to reconcile relationally. And I do one thing, first thing, every single time when they sit down in my office, I say, hey, tell me why you fell in love with her. And he'll tell a story like, oh, she was beautiful and her smile and her eyes and and the way she made me feel confident in the way I just couldn't wait to be with her and my eyes for every other woman just went away when I saw her. I was like, what made you fall in love with him? Oh, he was handsome and he was strong and he spoke to me in such a way that I felt so respected and valued and I knew he was gonna take care of me and, and that's why I fell in love with him and committed that my heart was only for him for the rest of my life. Here's what's never been said when I've asked that question. I have no idea. Hey, I, I don't know. I met this guy. Here we are 20 years later, three kids. And I have no idea. <laughs> now, you might think that in your worst moments, but nobody's ever said that to me. But what I have watched that do when people return to the basics is it starts to rekindle a little bit of a flame. So guys, try that this evening. You're welcome. Now, give, give that a try. When we are confused, returning to what is real is essential. Returning to what we know, and that's what the Apostle John is doing. At a time now when people are confused about what's truth, the world's confused, the world's divided, families are divided, people don't know what to believe and how to act and what to feel, and people have drifted away from the reality of the world around us into some fantasy world, and they don't even know it. But if you know what's real, by default, you expose what's not. So instead of trying to figure out all the weird things and all the things that are false, just learn what's real. The first century church had a habit of doing that. They had, uh, they had creeds. And if you grew up in some church traditions, uh, a, a leader, a priest, or somebody may walk out on the stage and say, uh, let's all repeat this. And you repeat a creed, like the Apostles' Creed. Anybody, could you say that from heart? Because you were told that your whole life. Like, you say this. This is just how you say it. There's actually several creeds in the New Testament that predate the writings of the New Testament, which means the writers of the New Testament knew these creeds and then repeated them as they were moved by the Holy Spirit to write down these words from God. 
One of those creeds is written by the Apostle Paul, and he said, I received this already, and I'm going to share it with you. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and it says this, For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. So they made two things very clear. One, Christ died for your sins and our sins. So they, they knew that. They stayed at that original, what was real. Jesus did that. Jesus also rose from the dead. And then they included with both of those statements, according to the scriptures. So they believed Jesus died, buried, and was resurrected. And they believed it because of the scriptures. So they believed the Bible was true and Jesus really rose from the dead. And they reminded each other of that. So that would have been a creed that the early Christians would have memorized. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. There's lifting up Christ and they're lifting up his words at the same time. That would have been their creed. That would have been what was real. That would have been what they returned to. So then when something, some weird teaching about, hey, Jesus didn't actually raise from the dead. Uh, that's just something people made up. No, he did. Scriptures say he did. We believe the scriptures. He's forgiven my sins. I've had that experience. He did raise from the dead. So because they had this creed to return to what was real, they were able to discern what was not. They had lost that ability. And John writes, to bring them back to what was real. You know, this year at our church, uh, as of this service, I think it's like 71 people have expressed their faith in Christ through baptism. Yeah. Five or six of those have been today, maybe eight. I can't remember, I've lost track. But several of those have been just today and last night. It's stories of somebody experiencing God and then sharing that experience with us. That's what John is doing in the book of 1 John when he says this in the next two verses. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us. Our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. And as we continue to journey through John's teachings over the next couple of months, there's a word that in Greek, it's, it's always one word, but it's translated different ways based on context. And the word is pronounced gnosko. And this Greek word gnosko simply means this, to know God by experience. Like you know God because you've experienced something. Those of you that have said yes to Jesus, you had some kind of an experience with God. It wasn't an experience. Yeah, a sermon might have motivated you. A song may have moved you. A video of somebody's life story may have, uh, may have encouraged you to make a decision. But those are all just links in the chain to get you connected to God so you can experience God for yourself. I don't want anybody just to experience God in this room. I do want you to experience God in this room. But I want you to all experience God for yourself. That's what John wanted for the church. And so he continually used the word gnosko to say you can know God by experiencing him. It's not just in your head. It's not just in your heart. It's everything. You can experience a holy God. Every time when we see somebody say yes to Jesus, that's an experience. And I think about the times in my life from the time I said yes to him all through the years until now, there have been numerous times where I had this real experience with God and you could not convince me otherwise. Everybody needs to have that. One of the reasons that we always take Easter Sunday and we celebrate baptisms is because Baptism symbolizes the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and it connects it to your death, to your old life, your burying your old sins in Christ, and you being raised to walk a new life. 
And so we say, well, we, we baptize people any day, anywhere, anytime. But this day, the day of Jesus' resurrection, the day we celebrate it, is also a day that you can celebrate your resurrection from death to life. The Apostle Paul says it beautifully in Romans chapter six when he connects the resurrection of Christ to our resurrection from sin to new life when he says this. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. What he's saying is, that's what's real. What's real is, you can go from old life to new life in Christ, and then baptism has that symbol of connecting you with the resurrection of Jesus. And so I'm not gonna go through an Easter Sunday without giving you an opportunity to do that, because I know not everybody has. And so we're, you're gonna see a video of three stories of people who have recently followed Christ and fully obeyed Christ and been baptized. And as that story is playing, you, some of you are gonna feel a tug at your heart. And, and we timed the service just so we could do this. If you're feeling that, when we sing the song after the video and you say, I wanna know God by experience, you can have an experience with him in front of all of us today. So when the, when the band comes out after the video, everybody stand up. We're gonna sing a great couple songs together. And if you're ready, just go through that back door right there. Dom and someone else will be back there to talk with you about taking that next step of your faith or even that initial step of your faith for some of you and saying, I'm not gonna let another day pass by. You can do a quick wardrobe change. We got it all back there for you. You can come right in here before the end of the song and we can celebrate your resurrection on the same day we're celebrating Christ's resurrection. Take a look at the screen. Baptism, the act, it symbolizes our own resurrection from a sinful life. But now it's time for you to make a decision because of your faith in Christ. Just take the next step. I came into the day just like any other day. To be honest, it was a fairly uneventful day. I really wasn't planning on getting baptized that day. Um, and so I knew that it was Baptism Sunday and was just listening to the message. And my wife had been actually telling me over the last number of months that maybe I should consider getting baptized to make it my own choice, which was important to me. And I just was unsure, to be completely honest. Uh, Donnie was getting into his message about baptism a little bit further, and I kind of had in the back of my mind, well, he hasn't said anything about you know those who have been sprinkled with water as babies, and, and I was like, I also don't want to dishonor my parents. Uh, and so he brought up both of those objections in the service. What if I was sprinkled as a baby? It's not biblical baptism, but you don't have to degrade what your parents did to you or criticize it. Just take the next step because they would have prayed for you to grow up to know Jesus. But now it's time for you to make a decision because of your faith in Christ. And then I just got really, really convicted like, okay, Lord, I hear you. You've now answered those things in my way. Um, and I just told my wife during the music, I said, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go and, and get baptized. And they put me in the water and he uh, asked me if I professed my faith in, in Jesus. And um, I said, yes. Me. For a long time, I was just thinking about getting baptized. I got a baptism book from my grandpa before it. Um, I was just pondering it on a long time, for a long time, and then Donnie was going over the importance of baptism, explaining it. Have you been thinking over it? Have you been pondering it? And you haven't gotten baptized? Just do it. So what if you've been following Jesus and you haven't been baptized? Then get baptized. Let's do it. And with the just do it was the one that moved me because I had been pondering it over for a long time. I look over at my mom 
sitting right there. <laughs> um, asked, can I get baptized? She was taken off guard a little bit, but she said, yeah. Um, I wanted to. And then I walked out of the auditorium, changed, came back in, and then I was baptized by my mom, and I just did it. It was cold, but I felt like a new person. I was consecrated as an infant. And when I completed the eighth grade, you did the confirmation classes in our church, and then you got baptized when you were confirmed. So those were not my choosing. It was my parents as an infant. As a teenager, it was kind of just what was expected of you. And once I came to Devoted City um, t about two years ago, I have actually met a friend who I worked with and found out she came here and she invited me to Bible study with her. I had never done a Bible study. I was very nervous because I am not a biblical scholar. There was so much I didn't know. And I was very nervous going in thinking all these women are going to be talking Bible verses over me and I'm not going to know what they're talking about. And I walked in and immediately I felt so welcomed through the um, lessons that we learned through the things that we learned in the Bible, I decided it was time for me to do this, to take this next, next step towards God and to devote my life to Him. Um, my daughter and I discussed it and we decided that she asked me if I'm ready and she was ready and we kind of encouraged each other that it was, it was time. Uh, my daughter and I were both very emotional about the day, knowing that we were doing it together was super special. Um, and both our Bible studies were groups were there. So again, um, I'm not sure I could have done it without my the women that have been in this study. So it's been a real great experience for me, uh, just what Devoted City has done for my life.